Welcome to our Cambly Chess Club Zoom meeting. It's our first Zoom meeting on a Sunday. We've been meeting every Tuesday almost for uh, two and a half years since uh, lockdown started in March 2020. Um, but the beginning of this 22-23 chess season, we decided to switch to Sundays. OK, so this is not um, a very complicated game in fact um i you know i said to martin that um, it might be interesting to see if some of um it has some instructive points perhaps for um, people who, uh, who are less experienced but noting that we have some more experienced people on i will try and talk to some of the points in this um i think the first thing to point out here is that the um uh, that i'm actually playing blitz and the quality of the play therefore won't be Wonderful. So it's two plus one, uh, wow, which means that's fast. Yeah, two minutes plus one second increment. Now, I don't normally like playing this speed because one second in increment means I can generally get into a winning position, and then you just don't have time to win the end game because yeah. I tend to take just more than one second a move, and other people seem to move the mouse quicker than I do. Um, so how? And, and I do know playing too much blitz can actually harm your chess because, and that's the advice I think to give to juniors in particular, um, because it can become addictive and you start playing for cheap traps. And uh, I think I actually played a uh, Paul Sloan, who's the, uh, you know, the strongest rated player in the club, uh, played him the other night and just played a, a move that I, I normally play in an opening at this sort of level. And it was just stupid to play it against Paul. Uh, I learned what to play, uh, how to play properly in the second game against him. But uh, so the, the one thing, though, I do find useful for this two plus one is trying out your openings and just, you, you know, and, and in fact, I, I'm going to show you exactly the way the opening went. So I play the, um, I play C6, Caro Khan. Now, this is an interesting move. And I must admit, the first time I saw it, I thought, well, well it's a blunder. Um, <laughs> But it actually has a name. It's called the hillbilly attack, and um, and therefore I would never have analysed any variations in this until it started coming up in Blitz. And you think, oh right, well, you know, people clearly play it. And one day over the board, somebody may play it against me. Um, I think one person has played it against me. I must admit, I've not learned really any variations against it because to me, I still think it's a bad move, and. Um, because I obviously reply like this, uh, white responds, I respond, black nearly, nearly always moves the bishop back to b3. And as far as I'm concerned, sorry? You mean white? Sorry, white uh, then nearly always moves the bishop back to b3. And as far as I'm concerned, I've gained the tempo. Black has got his bishop on that nice diagonal, which is then um, impacting uh, or hitting f7. Um, but as soon as I've blocked the pawn position up the structure with e6, then, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm ahead. And certainly, uh, you know, chess.com, uh, the engine says that black is ahead, which is, which is not bad after so few moves. So I think it's a mistake. Um, interesting in this game, my opponent played this move, which, uh, again, you know, if you look at the position, my opponent's now taken, uh, you know, moved his bishop twice, which, uh, as far as I can see, cannot be cannot be a good idea. May I say something? Yes, please. Yeah, after you play e4 and uh, c6, bishop f4, I think uh, d5 is good. Even e5 with the idea of d5 on the next move also looks like an interesting uh, idea, right? Okay. I'll, well, I, well, I must admit, this is where I was hoping to get something out of this by... Uh, asking people what they thought about this hillbilly attack and whether there were any other ideas. Um, now, I haven't got it set up on analysis, and uh, um, I'm worried that if I go into this, um, uh, the E5 move, but I th um, it will um, break the structure up of what I've set up. But I think you're right. I think it's probably worth looking at that. Um, and because seeing... the idea which I have in mind, I have not, I don't know the theory about this one at least, yeah. But the idea is after I play e5 and the, the next move will be d5. And yeah. if you exchange that, uh, black gets a nice center of e5 and d5 pawn. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I've So I'm a caro player as well. 
Okay. And I've got a little bit of theory here. So <laughs> e, um, e5, d5 actually loses. So black has an advantage in this position by playing uh, d5. But mm. e5, d5, you lose your advantage to knight c3. Um, so if you were to play e5 and then white replies knight c3, you can't reply with d5. And then I think you're in a bit uh -huh. of an awkward position. Okay, yeah, good, okay. point. good point. That, that is a good point, yeah. Although you could do knight f6, but then we're going into a different game. But yeah, no, that's 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 true. But mm -hmm. one thing I will uh, also add, see, uh, like if you think about the opening e4, uh, e5, and bishop c, uh, bishop c4, right? The yeah. bishop's opening. In the bishop's opening, there is an idea of playing c6 d5. That is why I was thinking uh, about e5. Yeah, yeah. Right? So uh, even if you play knight c3, I think knight f6 is playable yeah. with the idea of playing d5 anyway. Yeah. It's yeah. A main idea here when they play d5 is not to take the pawn and just drop the bishop back uh, as a gambit. Isn't that okay. what they do? I think that makes that makes sense. That if uh, so, so now what we're saying is if black goes bishop b, sorry, if white goes bishop b three, and I decide to take the pawn on e four, then yeah, suddenly my f seven square as black is looking oh, right. very weak. Right. Uh, queen can obviously come into h five. Um, yeah, I, I can I can definitely see that. Um, definitely see that Sebi. So that makes. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, amazing how complicated this game is after only two moves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's I, best I, for you, isn't it? I think I'll have to uh, look into this a little bit closer. But uh, um, so I'll, I'll stop playing through the rest of the moves. Again, please appreciate that it's a two plus one. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, you'll see that both of us make mistakes. Um, and I make less mistakes than my opponent. Uh -huh. um, and my opponent then starts playing in a different way near the end. And uh, I thought that was instructive, as well as the um, the mating sequence at the end. So, OK, sounds anyway, interesting. So game goes like this. And I think already, you know, um, I'm black. I've got the center. I've got uh, I've got one piece developed. Um, so, yeah, I'm ahead and I'm quite happy with this as an opening. Mm -hmm. Um, the rest uh, of the next few moves, fairly standard here. Um, all, all of my moves, the computer seems to like. Um, I think w one of them uh, I'm trying to think of here. Um, it even likes that one. Right. I think this is the first one where it says, yeah, that's not, um, not wonderful. Um, on the one hand, the rook is not really doing much on the uh, the e-file but obviously the idea of that move is that uh, my bishop on uh, e7 is defended my knight can move um, then and I can get rid of that annoying uh, bishop perhaps at some point um, I also thought that my rook uh, the only good file really for the rook is the c-file and I want to move the rook on a a8 to that um, well, why not move the rook on a8 to that instead then I, I agree, you know, again, that's perhaps what I should have done. Um, I just also want to point out this move here. Um, I find that um, that in the Karo Can, this is quite often um, a good move. Um, you know, you've got a double attack on the D pawn and on the B pawn. And it's, uh, it's quite often a good square to go to, particularly to back up C5 if I haven't played it. Um, you've got to watch out then for Knight A4. Um, but this is a common... Uh, a common square for the bishop to go to in this uh, this sorry the queen to go to in this sort of line okay um now i was um, also thinking about queen c7 what about queen c7 how do you find uh, what do you feel about queen c7 instead of queen b6 well i suppose queen c7 then you know potentially knight knight b5 Okay, so um, you have to prepare for it probably by playing a6, right? Yes, and you, you, you're quite right. Again, in these lines of the caro, it's quite often a good idea to get a6 in first, uh, particularly if the bishop is on f4, um, because then the knight can come in and threaten, you know, all sorts of problems on, uh, 
on c7. Um, quite often as well, if you don't do this and you've got your bishops your bishop lined up on d6 and you've got your queen on c7, then you lose you know a quite nice bishop for, for that knight. So yes, you're right. I think that uh, um, in this position, um, a6 is always a, uh, is always a good move as well. Yeah, so a6, queen, c7 uh, can also be a plan because I'm thinking that, okay, probably rook e8 and something e5 sort of a central break. Yes. Can be uh, thought of. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Okay. Um, I think here it's always interesting when you see black do, you know, rook. Uh, rook b1. It's it seems a bit of a waste of a rook to be defending a pawn, um, but I do think one of the problems in this line is that uh, you know you quite often you move your queen uh, to b6 to encourage white to play b3. You see that happen quite a lot, and that allows um, my bishop um, to take advantage of some of the holes. Then um, you know, and particularly start attacking that knight maybe around c3, mm. um, which which can be quite useful particularly if you can get a pin in if the king hasn't castled. So um, again, you know, rook, I'm not sure about uh, rook b1, uh, you know, maybe knight, knight a4 um, might, might be, that might've been a better move. Um, if I attack the knight, then white can always play, um, uh, well, it gets a bit tricky. Can he play c3? Uh, depends, because that can then, you know, it takes away uh, a square for the knight. But uh, anyway, I'm not sure rook b1 is the best move. Right. Um, this is a, um, an interesting move. Um, mm. Centralizes the queen, connects the rooks. Perhaps not a lot wrong with it, but um, you know, it's uh, uh, not really threatening to do anything. I guess White's just trying to develop his pieces here. There's not much of a plan. Um, so try and chase the bishop away or encourage something, and the uh, bishop goes back. So now I really do have to do something. The bishop's, uh, you know, I don't want to go g5. So uh, I go um, I go here. Now um, I'm not sure that was the best uh, best move really. Um, I don't think the computer thought so. I'm not sure what the best move was here actually. Um, I, um, oh yeah, believe it or not, I did want to point here. Um, the reason why the computer did not like this move is because the computer engine suggested that the best move in the position for black, and I don't think any of you would. Um, work this out. If you do, very impressed. Uh, queen a6 is what the computer oh. prefers. Oh. Uh, now, I don't like it because obviously queen takes queen. I've got doubled and isolated pawns and, you know, I don't really like it. But uh, I think this is the computer saying, look, white's queen is quite strong. Getting rid of it is a good idea. Mm. So, um, I was quite surprised that it suggested uh, queen a6. So, uh, but knight h5 looks like a good plan. I mean, generally, black is a little bit uh, behind, lacking in space. So uh, yeah. on general consideration, black should trade some uh, minor pieces, right? I, I, I agree. So obviously what I was expecting here is bishop takes bishop, rook takes, and then at some point the knight's going to feel a little bit out of it there. Uh, I am threatening to come in to, um, to f4. Um, but, you know, I'll probably end up going back to f6 um, and I've lost a move. But, yeah, you're right. I've got rid of that bishop. And, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't really want to, to keep the knight over there. So uh, I've, I don't know if you've heard the, the saying, which is uh, not an ancient one, but knights on the rim are dim is um, yeah. quite often worth uh, remembering sometimes whenever you have a choice of where to put your knight. Yeah, but one thing is there that if the knight is on the rim towards the opponent's king side, then it need not be that uh, dim, okay? Because like uh, in the mm -hmm. Joko piano, you would find that uh, the the black knight a lot of time wants to come to f4 and that knight becomes a real bone in black's throat, right? I mean, uh, yeah. that was also there. I, th I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, if it's going to come to f4, or if it's going to cause some damage down to the king, but but normally you don't yeah. put the knights on the edge. I think you're you you you're you're not saying don't put them on the edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, White plays a slightly uh, suboptimal move here. He decides he wants to try and keep the bishop, mm. and of course the obvious uh, move here now is uh, yeah, I'm just going to take the bishop and. Uh, 
Um, so which which pawn should uh, White be take with? Whoa, that's a tricky question. I think uh, with the H pawn. Yeah. Yeah, I think the F pawn allows some weird Attacking stuff them. in the middle. Yeah, with the queen lined up and everything. So basically one has to calculate typically, but both options are possible, right, in some sense. If you take with the F pawn, the D4 pawn is pinned. So E4, uh, E5 is possible. Yeah, yeah. I, correct. I think you point out, yeah. So quite often, um, you know, the, the general view here is that you should uh, take towards the centre because central pawns are more valuable than side pawns is one way of looking at it. Uh, taking with the F pawn, yeah, you're, you're right, Sevi, it does um, open up that... Uh, uh, D pawn uh, to a pin, which proves to be White's undoing in this game, actually, um, because White did play this. Um, but you do find at this level, sometimes people just are going for an attack uh, at any cost, and White is eyeing up the F7 uh, pawn, yeah. and uh, it's a bit of a gamble, and the gamble doesn't pay off here. So, yeah. um, so I, I, I think the the obvious thing that I've gained from here is I hadn't I had two knights, um, one of them on D, uh, D7 not doing a lot. Uh, now suddenly I've got, you know, I've, I've now got one working knight rather than one suboptimal knight. So, um, you know, that knight is looking quite good. It's blocking that uh, F7 square. Um, but, I think, but I think as suggested, E5 should have been played immediately, right? That drops no, no, the no. Pawn. Okay. It drops, drops the, the pawn. pawn. You have yeah, to protect it's... that rook, C, D8, and then probably that. Yes. Or queen yeah, I... C6. Yeah, but then you drop the pin, and yeah, it's weird. yeah, mm. yeah, you're probably right. Um, so White immediately jumps in here, um, and you can see he's he's doubled up on the f uh, f seven square now. If so that knight is, um, yeah, has to stay there. Um, but yeah, you can see what I do here now, and uh, you can see what the obvious threat is. Hopefully, yeah, Bishop takes knight. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, what had happened here was, again, if you have to excuse my next move, because I'm yeah. obviously looking at this game and I'm thinking, right, I've got a threat here. I'm threatening to take the knight. I hope white doesn't notice um, mm -hmm. that he can't be taken to pawn because then I win a piece. And so I'm solely focused on bishop takes knight and white does this. So white oh, defends wow. the knight. And I, have, I had the sort of my next move uh, already planned and I quickly banged out that move. Yeah, queen d4 was uh, winning. Queen d4 is obvious. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so I um, made an obvious, um, uh, you can see I made no mistakes. I made one blunder, that was the blunder. Um, I, um, interestingly in this move, I made 13 best moves, which I was quite pleased with. Mm. Uh, my opponent only made, according to uh, this, uh, about three blunders, but, uh, um, you know, I, th I think this, uh, you'll see. You're playing happens. so quickly, Mark. I mean, you, you said it was, what was the time period again? Two. It's two plus one, and I could show you the, uh, um, oh, you know, yeah. oh, you can see where we are, actually. We are playing yeah. very quickly, but, um, you know, we've still got over a minute each left. Yeah, but that's that's not much time in, in the middle game. I mean, you're playing very fast. Yeah. yeah two plus one, you are excused for murder also, so it's yeah. absolutely fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, now the queen goes back. So I said, ah, right, now I've got it. So, and this is obviously a blunder that loses the game. Oh, take so, the nine. Yeah, so I take this. Now... Wow. So you could say this is end of game uh, now. White could resign. Um, and what happens now is White starts playing even faster. He's, uh, uh, I think this has got an expression called dirty clocking. Um, yeah. You, you know, White trying to win on time. You can say that's unsporting, but it's part of the game at this level, I think. You have to accept well, it. Um, it's, part, it's part of the game on two plus one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one one second is almost zero. Uh, yeah. You, yeah, you're basically playing against somebody who's you're losing, but he's only got a minute on his clock. So what the hell are you going to do? You're just going to speed it up and uh, you know try to make him lose on time. Yeah. So I've got to play, um, uh, you know, play for 
Uh, well, Queen, say, Queen, Queen Kate's pawn is, uh, oh. Yeah. Where are we? Well, well, sorry, it's uh, twice so, moved. So white yeah. moves, white yeah. moves uh, away from the pin. Yeah. Um, obviously threatening the bishop. I need to take the pawn. What do I take with? Well, although, as I say, it can be difficult to win an end game. It shouldn't be difficult to win an end game when you're so far ahead of, on material. Uh, so I took the view here that taking with the queen and swapping off queens, yeah. I thought I would have time to win this end game. Uh, white obviously wants to keep it complex, moves his queen away. I offer another queen exchange mm -hmm. and white moves his queen away. Um, I then decide, right, let's yeah. get a few more exchanges. But in particular now, this square on e4 uh, is a nice home for the knight. So yeah. Let's take that. He can't take with the queen, so I've isolated his pawn. So again, we're moving into an end game. I'm quite happy with this. Uh, but yeah, knight here now. Suddenly, um, other things are now uh, potentially about to happen. I've got uh, um, some threats on f2. Uh, the C uh, C three pawn is looking uh, looking yeah. weak. So, and at some point, I'll I'll be stopping very shortly and asking you to predict the rest of the the <laughs> rest of the move. So oh. so quick here that White just hangs another oh. rook. But he, he didn't he didn't realise that was guarded. Yeah, and well, I think again sometimes they're playing very quickly. Yeah, maybe even hoping that um, that I don't notice he can take a rook. Well, fun, fun, funnily enough, when you played the previous move, I thought the B7 pawn was on mm. and I then noticed the rook. So that's that's a natural mistake because the rook on E7 is a funny placed rook. Yeah. And, you know, if uh, if I decide, right, I'm going to take that pawn on C3 with the knight or the rook because that's what, again, mm. what I'm fixed on and I've only got 50 seconds. Mm. Yeah, white takes the rook or even plays check. Mm. And things start getting interesting. Um, so yeah. So anyway, I'll have that free rook. Um, again, white. You know, let's attack anything. Try anything. Yeah. Uh, C four. Well, I'll have that pawn as well. Right. Now. Um, Should have played that move earlier. Yeah. Now. Um, white can win here in um, I think five moves. Um, sorry. Black can checkmate here in, the, in about five moves, um, but I chose uh, a longer option. So can yeah. you predict Black's best move in this position? Uh, oh, yes. Yes. Rook B1. Rook B1 and then Knight F2. Right. Well, I think Rook B1 would work, but apparently the quickest way to win is Queen takes Rook. I was going to say then the fork. Oh! Rook. Because if pawn takes rook, rook b1 is mating two. Yeah. Do that. Hang on, hang on. Just just talk us through that. Um so um if I take the rook, yeah, and if uh white b takes the queen, yeah. I think he really has to, yeah, then rook b7 to rook b1, yeah, uh, check all uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. all, all yeah. white can do is interpose the queen, yeah. You take yeah. the queen, you get mate. Yeah, okay. But you can imagine 40 seconds to play. I'm not really thinking of queen sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And generally, you know, um, rook, 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 rook B1 looks good as well. Right. So I think this is now Rook B1 is checkmate in seven, um, I think. So we'll allow um, everybody who wants to predict the moves. Uh, next move uh, for Black. Oh, I know. Do Knight I take the Rook? D3 maybe? Oh, okay. Knight F2. Knight F2. Yeah. yeah. Knight F2. Knight F2 looks wonderful. Yeah, because now, as you can see, that uh, I've fought the queen. White can't retake the knight because the rook is pinned. So I win the queen. Yeah. Yeah. So game over. But what you're saying is it's still mating four or five as well. Yeah. And I've got, uh, I've still got 33 seconds. So white's open. Yeah. yeah you've, I make still, a match. you've still got a win. That's the thing, isn't yeah. it? But it is a false checkmate still all the way from here. That, um, yeah, queen d4. Excellent. Well done. Now, if white goes king f1, then Mate. queen f2 checkmate. So white goes here. I'm, I'm knight not, f2. Knight well, f2. Smothered mate. Yeah. Right. Now, that's the key thing here that I was um, hoping that 
Yeah, Did you if, spot if this? there were some relative beginners on here, this would show a nice check mating pattern that you well, need well, to let, learn. Let's, let's, let's leave it open to people who haven't spotted it. What, 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 what should Black be doing? Um, so, so every, uh, yeah, so who wants to go with the next move? Um, what's the next move for Black? Who knows what it is? I think I know. I know. What about James or Tarol? Or yeah, I mean, I think it's a knight f2, then knight uh, h3, and uh, yeah. queen yeah, f2. Well done. Right, yeah. so, Sebi, can you see the next move? Yeah, I know the pattern. It's knight h3, and then queen g1, mate. Yeah. Queen g1 rotates, and then knight f2, too. Yeah, correct. And it's, now... It, it, it's very clever, isn't it? Because it gives up the queen and still wins. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm, you know, in the standards of this sort of game, I had 23 seconds is still quite a long time. But I think the important oh, thing good. is, you know, recognizing when you get to here that, ah, smothered mate. Yeah, it's. Um, um, I mean, to, to be honest, Mark, you could win without that because you've, you could. you've, you've won the queen. So, so if, if you were going to play, if you had 10 seconds to go, you, you know, you're right to go for the smothered mate, but most players probably, if they, if you were a bit short of, shorter of time and, and couldn't quite see that quick enough, you might just sort of carry on and you'd really have a game on your hand to mate in 33 um, seconds. Yeah, I think that, I think that is the thing here. I, you know, I'd be aiming to get rid of the rook as quickly as possible because, you yeah. know, you, you need to do something and... Um, uh, you know, and you've also I've also played in positions like this where obviously, and I'm sure we all have, where white gets rid of the rook and loses a couple of pawns, and you've got to watch out for stalemate as well. Yeah. So, uh, but, but yeah. there is another alternative winning way. I mean, you can play rook c2, uh, and then I mean, this is definitely the most elegant and uh, beautiful. But uh, can you back up, uh, back up uh, one one or two moves? Yeah, yeah he takes the. Yeah, so here uh, it is white stone, right? It, it is um, black stone. Black stone. So black. Yeah. So rook c two pretty quick. Yeah, rook c two, and then you will play queen queen, queen e two, and then mate. Yeah, rook c two, and then uh, queen e two, and then mate. Yeah, yeah. So so you can you, delay the inevitable by one move. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's that's it, isn't it? I mean. He's got to go rook all the way. Well, then now it's mate. Now it's mate on d d one. D one. Yeah. So he's got to pay his rook back, and then you go rook e two, and then you've got mate. Yeah. So actually, actually, that's almost as quick as the smother mate in moves. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but you rightly spotted the the pattern, the uh, the smothered mate pattern. But actually, if the smothered mate pattern hadn't worked for some reason, then then. This this sequence is actually better, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that this works. This is easier. Well. I mean, either Easy queen enough, e2 yeah. or queen e4 also. Both ways are winning. I mean. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's a good game. That's a very good, interesting game. Yeah, yeah, very okay. nice. So, and again, I think one of the good things about Blitz, uh, again, learning some of these check mating patterns um, can help you watch out for that in a real game. And uh, I think there is uh, one of the lessons on... Uh, on chess.com that you can do is learning some of the basic checkmates. And I have to admit, not considering myself a beginner, I was quite surprised at how much I learned mm. by going through some of the mating patterns. And, uh, um, you know, so I think since then I've been much more confident about looking for uh, smothered mates and also for um, looking at some other mates that I hadn't uh, seen before. So always useful. Um, you know, particularly if you're going to take part in matches this year, you'll find that you're going to get into some positions where you're mm. short on time. And uh, mm. if you might want to play in some of the rapid play games that we've got and uh, yeah, we're going to, you, mm. you're going to have uh, th things like this where, you know, it's quite important to, uh, um, uh, yeah, to have practiced at this sort of speed, but yeah, it shouldn't be, you know, a main part of your play, but I think playing, uh, you know, mm. uh, playing a bit of this every now and then, certainly not more than, than half an hour at a time is always quite useful. So, so anyway, you, You'd so that's interesting, Mark. So you'd recommend I've never played two plus one, 
Uh, so you'd recommend playing it for half an hour just to sharpen up certain skill areas? Yeah, I think I think if you, you know, you know let, let's say you, 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 you had a um, an opening line that you want to play. You, you know, let's say, for example, you're a D4 player and you suddenly want to start playing E4. And um, you might want to play E4 and say, right, I want to know what to do against a Sicilian and then suddenly find out that, well, well, hang on, I've played 20 games now at Blitz and I've had four um, center, center counter or Scandinavian. Um, um, uh, and therefore, yeah, it's useful to see what people might play. It doesn't necessarily equate that that's what you're going to get over the board. But as I say, playing Caro Can as, as I have here, it's, it's made me realize that people play that hillbilly attack a lot more uh, mm. than I expected. And you have to be prepared for that. Um, so it's very good for openings, very good for pattern recognition that you've got to get at the end, particularly mating uh, patterns. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, it's a little bit too fast, Martin, to practice your end games. That, that's the one problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. because you're not going to have time to win a proper end game if you've only got a second. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you'll need at least five and, seconds. And, and, and presumably the downside is also with all very fast play that you're you you can't find the best move. You have to find a, a good enough move. So yeah. you, you're starting to encourage your brain to look for uh, a, a good non mistake rather than a, a better move. Is that a fair comment? I, I think that is fair. And sometimes you're playing for easy traps, and so yeah. it can encourage the wrong behaviour. Yeah, and uh, you've got to realise that. Now, if you if you want to focus on this part of your game, fine. But if ultimately, like a lot of us, we're aiming for, uh, you know, to improve our play in standard rating over the board, mm. um, you know, then this is a you know a, a useful training uh, thing which shouldn't become a, a focus really. Uh, I think most people would say, but uh, it's worth a try. It sounds like I've never done it, so I think I might give it a try. Just on a, on a on a one off basis to see what happens. Yeah, and I, th I think it's also worth pointing out. You know, you, you look at the chess.com ratings, and uh, you know, my rating here one five oh seven, very low. Um, I think it indicates that I'm not very good at this uh, um, speed on the whole. You, you know, I'm, uh, my over the board rating is eighteen ten, I think something like that. Well, um, isn't everyone going to be a, on average a lower rating playing fast? I think you'll find that there's some people who are very high rated uh, on, on this and, you know, we're compensating for that. So um, I, I think if you're a very good player, um, that, then you'll be over 2,000 on everything. So uh, All right. I, I don't I know, was, does sorry. anybody else have a, have a higher rating than, than this at this level? I was reading a book, I mean, uh, and one, in fact, the author suggests that uh, before reading a opening book or maybe video, what you should do is play some, like I play sometimes this five plus three blitz on leeches. Yeah. It is basically to know the opening uh, variation, uh, to basically internalize the opening variation. And uh, you will get some idea about the middle game plan also by playing that blitz. But two plus one is very fast for me. Five plus three blitz is okay, but two plus one is really, really uh, fast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. It, it does get the adrenaline going as well, so you have to watch out for that. And, uh, <laughs> it, you know, it's it's not it's not important chess. They're not important games, but you know, I, I find my adrenaline gets going, which is yeah. Don't don't take it too seriously. I think more than a yeah. you know yeah. Because you'll make you'll make horrible mistakes and be annoyed with yourself more <laughs> often than yeah, yeah. normal chess. Exactly. Correct, correct. Two plus one is more like a bullet in some sense, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I couldn't go any faster than that. I'm going to give it a try on the basis of uh, what we've talked yeah. about. That's yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. You're you're right that um, th this uh, this speed is uh, is referred to. You can see uh, that is meant to symbolise a bullet. So oh, yeah, is, yeah, is bullet chess. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, I thought it was an instructive game. Uh, yeah. in a couple of areas. Yeah, I, I've learned some extra lines in the. Uh, uh, in the hillbilly attack, which I'm going to go and have a way, I'm uh, going to go and look at that. So, thanks for those that recommended uh, that I've got to be prepared for the bishop going back. I think Seppi said that, and I'm going to have to, yeah, prepare. Well, what would I do? And I think I need to look at the d5, um, uh, what to do if white plays an early d5, uh, irrespective, sorry, an, an early d4, 
Um, yeah. I have to look at that. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, yeah. And uh, back you, to Mark. you, Martin. Thank you. And I'll stop uh, stop sharing. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That's good. That's good. OK, um, so um, anyone else? I think I think um, uh, Siddhartha, you're going to show something. Yeah, so I was asking what do you guys want to look at? I played a blitz game, five plus three long back on leeches. I can show you that. Or I had, uh, I mean, I was, I thought about uh, talking about uh, rook ending, especially the Lucina, the different plans and uh, methods to win and some rook one ending. So whatever the audience likes, I can do that. Okay, well, I'll vote for the rook, rook, rook endings, but what do other people think? Well, that will be more useful for the audience in general, that is for sure. I, I, I'd, I'd agree with Martin. I quite like, um, you know, I have learned the Lucina position and uh, the Lucina end games, and because I never seem to come across them in over the board, I always forget them. So, um, and I think one thing again in our over the board play, because we, uh, you know, tend to play games out nowadays. Uh, you need to know your in-game technique. So, yeah, I'd be interested in that. But okay, sure, sure. So well, let's jump. Let's jump to that in that case because I also okay. am more interested in that. Okay. I mean, I I like the rook ending, so I will. Uh, try okay, to... let's do that. Okay, so can you give the share to me? I mean, okay, I will click share screen. Okay, share. Yeah, you should be able to do that now. Yeah. Okay, so let. Excellent. Me... Yeah, see that. Chess base. <clears throat> and uh, I will set up a position. Let me set up a position. So basically, I will tell you the different techniques, okay? Because there are several techniques and uh, which is very important to understand them. Okay, so let's take this. Uh, We'll first consider it as white to play. No, before starting with the Lucina position, I want to tell a few things. In this uh, rook pawn ending, I mean, king plus pawn plus rook versus king plus rook, generally the winning side wants to cut, I mean, whenever you can put the king in front of the pawn and somehow cut off the king so that your pawn, I mean, your king is escorting the pawn, then it is a fantastic, uh, I mean, generally you will win the game. So uh, basically the key point is that the black king should be cut off from the promotion square. That is the key thing. Because if you remember the Philidor thing, we'll, we maybe someday we'll talk about that. The king is in front of the pawn and then we do the third rank defense. So it is important that the king is cut off. Okay, this is what we are trying to achieve. Now, before talking about, there are three techniques to win. Uh, so anyone knows the several te the different techniques to win here in this position, suppose it is white to play. How would you, uh, I want the audience to participate so that when I explain then the concept would become more clear. So what are the techniques you know to win in this position? It's, it's, it's a funny timing because I've, uh, uh, going to the chess games, I've been brushing up on some end games. So, um, the way I know how to do it is uh, the building a bridge method. Um, okay, building the bridge is one method. What else? Anyone knows any other method? You're, you're, you're going to have to, at some point, I'm sure, explain what that building the bridge method is. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. I would be talking about, okay, anyone else has some idea what other methods and techniques are available I, here? I, I, I've, I've seen and I'm heard good. other ways, right. but I forgot what they're called and I can't recall exactly. So I'm going to say, I don't know. Okay. What about uh, anyone else who wants to, Alisa or uh, Tural, anyone who wants to say something? I don't know the name, but Rook E1 and then you can, when the king moves, you can go King E8 and then there's no way to stop promotion, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so you want to say use uh, Dr. Tarash's maxim, uh, rook behind <laughs> the pass pawn, right? If that's what it's called. Yeah, okay. So uh, uh, anyone else wants to uh, chip in? Well, I wasn't I sure if what Sebi said. Uh, I, I don't, Sebi said rook e1, but doesn't. Uh, I said rook g1. Yeah, rook I was going to say, doesn't rook g1 just 
work very quickly. Yeah, um, yeah rook okay. d1, king king f6, king uh, king f8, and then and then pawn queens. Oh, okay. the, okay. the king can go back to f6, the uh, black king, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. So you have an idea that rook g1 is one uh, way. I mean, you can start with rook g1. Uh, and if he plays king f6, that's a terrible move. That's a horrendous move because king f8 and you you have to resign there. But yes. he has king h7 or king h6. Oh, okay. Okay, not king f6. King f6 is uh, definitely a horrendous move because there is one concept in the rook... Uh, in this uh, rook ending, you need shelter. Basically, what you are doing, you are hiding in the shadow of the yeah. defender's king. Yeah. He cannot play rook f2 now. Okay. So one thing I'll tell you, shelter is an important uh, concept. And there are different ways in which you achieve the shelter. One is you hide in the shadow of the opponent's king. The second is you hide in the shadow of your own king. Mm. Okay. Uh, I mean, own rook. And the third is you use your pawn as an umbrella. Like here, if you give a check rook h8, rook a8, then I just push and promote. I use the pawn as an umbrella and I uh, win. <laughs> so, okay, he can't play this horrendous move. He will play king h7. Now, how would you proceed? Uh, people who suggested rook g1, how would you proceed now? Suppose he doesn't play the horrendous move king f6 and he plays king h7. Now, you threaten mate on f7, king f7. Okay, yeah, so because he's uh, back, he's very close to the edge, so you have the checkmating. No, but then I will play rook f2. Mm, okay. mm. You have not made progress, right? Mm. Uh, so what about king, king d7? King d7, okay. King d7 uh, has an idea. Okay, so then I play rook d2 then. Then, then d6, and then uh, attacking to the uh, rook. Okay, so let's see that because you, if you do not have shelter, it will not work. You play this king um, d7, I play rook d2 now. Yeah, that's nice. Sure, sure, sure. It is a reign of checks. Okay, I can give reign of vertical checks, and if you do not have shelter, then uh, you will not be able to win. Because okay, let's. What, what about will you play? Uh, what about rook d5, and then? You can set up shelter or, uh, on the fifth file with your rook. Yeah, yeah. We'll come to that. Rook g5 or rook g4. We'll talk about that. But first one has to appreciate why not this simple idea of just walking your king out. Mm. It will not work because I have these reign of vertical checks. Yeah. And if you play king uh, c6, you might think that, okay, I can start marching the king rook closer to the, I mean, the king closer to the rook, but it will not help. I will continuously check. And when your king is quite separated, maybe if you try to do this, then I will go behind the pawn. Yeah. And uh, you will not make any progress that way. So this is, mm -hmm. one has to appreciate that just this uh, simplistic approach of pushing the king to the edge file or whatever, I mean, pushing the king separated by two files and then uh, just taking the king out will not help because you do not have any umbrella from the reign of vertical checks. Right, right, yeah. Right? Okay, now, once you have this, that this immediate king f7, or uh, I mean, king d7, both are not working because of the same rationale. Now, how would you proceed then? Someone has suggested an idea there, which is good. Can you come again now? Rook g5. Yeah. Rook g5 is one way. Uh, and rook g4 is the more preferred way. I will. I want to talk about it. I will uh -huh. talk about rook g5 also. Rook g4, why you play that? Because you anticipate that later on when you bring your king out and he gives the reign of, uh, he starts giving continuous mm. vertical checks, later on your, your rook will be able to interpose. Okay, because your king will be probably on e5 right, and yeah. your rook will come to e4 and block the check. I will show you that so yeah. that it becomes clear because you cannot be separated more than a, a rank from the pawn. Okay, so mm -hmm. I will show you. Mm -hmm. You play rook g4, rook g5 also I will show, but rook g5 is not the best because what happens that you will get into queen versus rook ending. I will uh, talk about it. Rook g4. Now, 
suppose he traps your king he plays rook d2 or rook f2 whatever way you think of you're not letting the king out but the king will come out from one way or the other you can't trap it from both the ends mm -hmm. right one of the ways uh, he will escape now he comes out you you are basically black as a defender is trying for perpetual check yeah okay reign of uh, vertical checks and when the pawn, king is separated then you go behind the pawn and a rook behind the pass pawn is the what Dr. Tarash uh, recommended and that always holds. So now you what generally holds. I would not say always, but it holds in the majority of the cases. Rook f2, king comes here, rook e2 again check, he plays king f6, and now when he comes here, rook f2, you now you see the point of rook g4. Mm -hmm. You anticipated this. Okay, now if he plays this check, you will just block. And since you have pushed the king by two files, you are winning. This is the bridge building method, okay? This is, but the bridge building method also has the same concept. You want to, pro, you want to pro, uh, provide a shelter to your king. You basically want to, uh, you want to have an umbrella. The umbrella is this rook which protects you, which interposes, and uh, you are able to get out from the reign of vertical checks. Okay, this is the idea which is there. Rook mm -hmm. G5, let's talk about Rook G5. Why Rook G5 is not the best, even though it is winning. But after Rook G5, I have a chance of harassing your Rook. Mm. And again, you can win, you can play that, or you can say that I'll play king f7. This is a tactical solution. You will take the rook, you'll promote to a queen, but the queen versus rook, surprisingly, is a very difficult ending. I mean, it is uh, a really, uh, it is, I mean, not easy. If you try to play against stockfish, I mean, uh, you can imagine that it is quite tough. Queen versus rook, even though it looks simple, it's not a simple ending. That is why you do not go for this but rather you avoid this queen versus rook ending by playing rook g4. The bridge has to be built on the fourth rank, not on the fifth rank. Even though rook g5 mathematically is winning. Okay, so this is one technique. Uh, anyone has a doubt that you first throw in a check. And one more thing, when you throw in a check, you also need that the king is separated from the pawn by two files at least. If he's separated by two files, you cannot just bring the king out, but you first build the bridge and then you bring out the king. Okay, and also understand this, this is a symmetry thing that if you say that, okay, I will trap you from rook f2, then I will come out this way mm. in d7. And the same logic, okay, you have to give a check. If you do not give a check, it's over. I come here, you give a check. Okay, I come here, you again have to give a check. And I come here, and now when you give a check, I just block and mm. you know. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, so this is one thing. I want to tell you one more thing here before going to the next technique, because a lot of times people will play a little bit trickier. Okay, so that is why we have to understand all the thing. After this, he played rook d2, suppose you went here uh, and he gave a check, you went here. He gave a check, you went here. Now, Suppose he plays rook e1. Now I want to ask you, what would you play? Oh. Not what very difficult. You can yeah. find it out. You just think. Uh, can you go rook g5 now? Yes. Now you build the bridge on the fifth rank. Yeah. Okay. It's too late for him to harass you. Yeah. So you have to see that if he doesn't throw in a check but has played a waiting move, then what you do, you can push the bridge to the fifth rank. Very important, rook g5, now you will go, your intention is to play rook e5. And it is game over for black, he can't do anything, mm. okay? Uh, one more thing I want to tell from here. <laughs> After this check, sometimes he might play king at six. I mean, this is another line, there is not much difference, but you need to know these subtle differences because uh, sometimes we get confused what is happening here, okay? Oh. He has come to the sixth rank, what? Now I can still build build the bridge. There are several ways to win. I uh, Here there are several ways to win, okay? But I can still build, build the bridge here. He can harass my rook, right? Yeah. 
Certainly, he can harass my rook. He can just come and attack the rook. But right. now you go to the eighth rank, and you tell him, that, okay, you cannot trap me from both the ends. You can trap me either by rook d2 or rook f2. Suppose you play rook f or rook d2, then I will come here, king f7. Mm -hmm. Now you will give a check, and I will. I can go via this way, king g7, king h8. I can do that, or I can start chasing the rook. Okay, you will see the difference. He comes okay. here. I will play king d6. Now you will give a check, but I start attacking your rook. Now going behind the pawn doesn't help because my rook, <laughs> is, rook is on the eighth rank. Mm. Important mm. point: if the rook reaches the eighth rank, it is helping the pawn to promote. Okay, you if you go behind the pawn, it doesn't help because I just push the pawn and I'm winning. Okay, so this this is the uh, this is the method, the first method which you need to know. And someone might ask why we need three different methods, but why we need three different methods because you might not get the same position. In some other position, some other techniques might be needed. Okay, so that is why you need to understand all the methods. Now, rook e1, rook behind the pass pawn, which Dr. Tarash has mentioned, is not working right now. Who can find a good defense from black? Why it doesn't work? Rook d2. Yeah, rook d2, just trap the king. The king is trapped, the king is not. You need a you need mm. a way for the king to escape, right? The king is imprisoned by the black king and the black rook. They are very active. You will not be able to win like that. But you first throw in a check. He plays king h7. Now rook e1, rook behind the pass pawn. Now you will win because you have won a crucial tempo. Why? He needs to trap your... King, right? Now I'll just take, I'll bring this king out. What you want to do? You can give a check from rook d2 or rook a, h7, uh, rook a7. It doesn't matter. You play rook a7, and start marching the king closer and closer to your rook, right? You give a check, I come here and it's game over. Mm. Also, if you give a check from here, Rook d2, it doesn't help. I start marching the king. The king I'm using as an attacking piece now, not mm -hmm. as a defensive piece. You play rook c2, king b4. You play rook b2, sorry, uh -huh. rook b2. I can play king a4 or king c4, doesn't matter. I'm marching my king closer and closer and you run out of the checks, right? Yeah. So this is another technique, rook behind the pass pawn. Why this is important? Because in some other positions, pawn on the sixth rank, you need this rook behind the pass pawn. That is why we are talking about it. The third technique, which is actually more important than the rook behind the pass pawn, is uh, what I call is controlling the file. Okay, controlling the file adjacent to the pawn, but on the opposite side to the king, to the defender's king. This is because you want to hide your king in the shadow of the rook. I told you, right? Shelter is the most important thing. Either you hide in the shadow of the defender's king, this line, which uh, I think uh, people said this, this is your hiding in the shadow of the defender's king, right? Now, you can also hide in the shadow of your own rook. And how do you do that? You throw in a check. He goes here. Throwing in a check is always good because you are pushing the king away, further away. So that is why it is always recommended. If you can push the defender's king, it's a good technique. You're pushing him two files away from the scene of action. That is always recommended. Now you play rook d1. Okay, this is an important technique. I will, I will uh, talk more about it. Why? He will trap you. But now I will come out. King d7, right? Now you will play rook a7. I play, I can play, I cannot, I have to be, I'm tethered to the pawn. So I'll play this. You'll play rook a6, ah, rook yeah. d6. Now you play rook a8, again defending the pawn. I mean, pre preventing a promotion, but rook d8. <laughs> and now you give a check. My king is again going to march towards your rook and it is game over because I will just play this. You will 
rook a5, king c4, rook a4, and then king b3, and then it is uh, winning. Right? Yeah. So anyone has a doubt regarding these three techniques because because they and you have to the way I have uh, read it and then I try to make my own notes. You have to know the uh, make some uh, statement so that it can re get registered in your mind. The building the bridge technique is basically you are trying to uh, shield your king from vertical checks by interposing with the rook. Okay, this technique, the third one, which I have, and rook behind the pass pawn is simple, but Sometimes it will not work, okay? Uh, sometimes it is not available. Like when you play rook e1 in the beginning position, it is not helping you because he just traps your rook, right? We looked at this, that you play rook e1, he just traps your rook, it is not working, right? So, uh, and the third technique, which, we, which I talked about, controlling the adjacent file to the of the pawn, mm -hmm. but on the opposite side of the king. Okay, why? Because if you control this side, it will not help. You will not be able to liberate your king. Suppose you say that, why not? I'll just uh, control this file, I'll control the F file. I'll play it. It, it will not help because I'll just uh, trap your king still, right? Your king is imprisoned. So it won't help. That is why you want to control the file adjacent to the pawn, but on the opposite side of the defender's king, right? It is slightly long worded, but this is a concept you have to understand that you want to play rook d1, not you want to control the d5. And also one more thing I want to add, immediate rook d1 also wins. It is not that you have to, thro throwing in a check is good technique. This is what uh, authors recommend that when the check is throwing, is sending the black king away from the scene of action, you should definitely give a check. But if you do not give a check and just take this control, you'll still win. I want to show you this also. Same logic. Suppose he plays not rook a6, but he plays rook a8. Or suppose he traps your king. He says, I will not let you uh, get out. Right? This is logical that he is not letting you out. Now what you will do? You'll play rook d8. Okay? Uh, suppose what can black do? Black can play a move like king f6, mm. attacking the pawn, right? Now you throw in this check. He can't play a move like king e5 because otherwise you will do a rank cutoff. Rank cutoff is terrible news, okay? So he has to go back. And if he goes back, then uh, what will you do here? Yeah, you can win by this rook e6 now and then bringing rook behind the pawn you can keep or you can even uh, yeah rook behind the pawn and release your king that way you will win because uh, at this point he can give a check he will come here and uh, he he's losing here because he will give a check then you'll come out and you will win this way right but starting from the beginning position you should throw in a check okay that is more logical that is what uh, all the authors recommend you throw in a check and then play rook d1. That is the best way. Or you build the bridge. Or the third one, I mean rook behind the past one. So before I talk about some other positions in the Lucina, is this concept uh, clear to some extent what we have talked about, the different techniques? Or mm -hmm. someone has a doubt, I can yeah. talk about it. All the techniques are clear? They, 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 they are clear. Um... Uh, however, you know, I think you've got to practice them yourself to make sure you remember them. Yeah, yeah, that is certainly there. But now I will ask you some uh, interesting problems, okay? I will ask you, now you guys said you want it. Now I'll try to bring out some interesting problems on this Lucina itself and try to ask you how you do this technique in this case. Okay, so let's give this position and you are white to play and suppose I want you to use the technique third. Definitely technique two bridge building will be easier, but suppose I want you to try the technique three though. So what would you do? Can someone come with an idea? How would you use technique third? You want to control the D file, but how would you control it? Well, you always said it's good to make a check to force the king away. Okay, certainly. Rook G1, he will play king at seven then.
Anyone has an idea after that what to do? My 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 screen is frozen. I think I'm still seeing the the rooks and the. Is that still we are looking for that one? Yeah, yeah. The rook is on D two. Black rook is on D two. Oh yeah, yeah. So I think after after check. D <clears> one. <throat> okay. I was not moving. I was trying help. Try. I was in a way asking you to visualize rook G one king H seven. Then how would you do? <laughs> You don't want to use the bridge method here, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to use the bridge. Bridge is definitely rook g4, right? Suppose you want to go with the third technique. I, I then think king uh, f8, maybe? No. I, I was thinking king f7 to threaten mate, and then he has to give you a check. To stop king f7, it. rook f2, then? Uh, king back to e8. And, and then, then again rook d2. He goes back to d2, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Position would repeat. So basically, anyone, Mark, you have an idea? <laughs> Sorry, uh, while I'm eating. Apologies. Okay, okay, no, okay. So uh, basically, here what you do is you transfer your rook via a1 to a8 to d8, and you challenge him on the d5. I'll uh -huh. show you that you have that much time because this you are your position is overwhelmingly. Uh, superior to the opponent. Okay, mm -hmm. it is not an issue of time as, ha as happens in the middle game. This is a position where you have overwhelming superiority. You only have to bring your pieces to optimum squares. Okay, so this is a difference from the middle game. This has to be appreciated. So you play rook g1, he goes to king h7, you play rook a1. Why? Okay? He will play king to uh, g7 because he wants to imprison the king. You will play rook eight. Okay. He can play, I mean, what do you think? He can just stay there. Rook d1. It other moves might make no sense. If you go any other way, it will not help. Because if you play some other move, like suppose you want to play a move like rook b2, then I just bring the king out. And you know my rook has reached the last rank. So if you play a yeah. check, you give yeah. a check, my king is an attacking piece now. Yeah. I, mean, I don't use the king as a defense piece but rather as an attacking piece and it is game over. So what you can do is after he goes here, you can play rook d1. Now I challenge you on the d5. Okay, extremely important. You are forced to evict the d5. You can't do anything else. Okay, so let's go there rook a1. Or even if you play rook e1, it doesn't help. My king comes out. And now I'm using, I will be using the king as an attacking piece. Okay, now you can't help. You can throw in a check from d1 or a7, it doesn't matter. Mm. Throw in a check from a7, my king, okay, first I will guard it for a one move because I can't immediately play, play mm. king c6. But now when you attack, okay, I just come for closer. Mm. And you are lost here because what you can't play, I mean, rook e6 makes no sense. I'll just push the pawn and promote. Yeah. Right? So this is the point that if, suppose he tries to trap your... Uh, I mean, uh, he tries to trap your, uh, he tries to control the D file, but then also it doesn't work because you have such a, a, I mean, overwhelmingly superior position. You have that time to maneuver the rook from G1 to A1 to A8. You have, you have to do the check first though, because otherwise the king could come to F6 at some point. Uh, yeah, it is always, see, uh, this is what everyone's, I mean, this is logical also that whenever you get, see an opportunity, even if the other line works, it would not be called a good technique if you just do it immediately. And suppose it is winning, then you're walking on a tight rope, right? right. Yeah. So it is always better that you push the defender's king from the scene of action. So that is why it is recommended. And that is why even if rook a1, rook a8, and rook d, uh, d8 works immediately, it's not a great technique, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that is why Rook G1 is uh, recommended by all authors from starting from Doretsky and uh, Jesus de la Villa and all these guys. So this is one thing. <clears throat> uh, I also want to talk about a position which I constructed and which is actually easy, but there is an insight, insightful thing which is there in that. Okay, So it's not a very difficult position, but I just want to ask you that position and see how will you uh, win in that position. Uh, suppose I tell you this position. 
Who's to move? Right to move. <clears throat> this I created on my own, okay? This is not a difficult problem, but I will tell you why, how, why I created and why I was happy with this creation. I, I'm happy with Rook F1. You want to play Rook F1. Does, okay. that, does that work? Rook F1 doesn't throw away the win. That is, see, the position is overwhelmingly is good, right? It is not in any way you will be throwing away the win. That is for sure. <laughs> Unless there is, there are ways where you can throw away the win. I will talk about that. But Rook F1 is, uh, what is your idea there? Well, I, it, I'll, it, I'll seems, play. it seems logical to stop the king moving to the F file. Um, okay. Uh, if yeah. I play Rook A2 there, then? Yeah. Mm. Then again, Lucina sort of thing is coming, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not so good. Yeah, so rook f1 is not. Uh... No, no. So, so should the rook be going up, up to g uh, a a5 or a6? Rook a6. Why you want to play rook a6? What is the idea there? I mean, if I play rook d2, what is your idea there? You have to think. Uh, you have to tell the idea also, right? I mean, there has to be some idea, otherwise. These endings, yeah. basically, you have to have some conceptual clarity. It is not the moves you can memorize. It's the idea you have to understand and then think about the move. This is how I, uh, I mean, when yeah. I have tried to learn, it is. Yeah. So, okay. so can, you, yeah. can you play? Uh, so my, my idea is maybe rookie one to get behind the pawn and then any okay. rook move. It's rook e1, I'll time play time. rook d2. I'll not let you uh, do with that. Rook behind the pass pawn is there, but I'll trap your king. And, and then doesn't that get put us in the previous position if I yeah, yeah. check? Certainly. You can transpose into that position and win. Mm. But I want to ask you guys, what about the bridge building method? Whether <laughs> it works here or not? Because why I came up with the position, I'll tell you the logic, uh, the genesis of it. What I thought was, I was so fascinated and so hooked on to that. Everyone says build, bridge building, bridge building. Do you think the bridge building will work here? <clears throat> that is the question. Whether the bridge building will work or not. <clears throat> so what I found is bridge building will not work. I'll tell you the reason. In bridge building, what you do, you, look, you give a check, right? Yeah. And uh, you remember that uh, Mark was uh, telling King F6 doesn't work because it was, I told it was a horrendous move when the rook was on D2. But, but here never, it is it. not a horrendous move. Mm. Okay. Now it is not a horrendous move. That is why if you play King F8, uh, no. it, oh. you can't play King F8 because I, I, there is a forced trade of rooks and you will lose the pawn. It's not a mate, but I'll block it. Right? You see the difference? I mean, this is why I came. Imagine your rook in this position. I What I started was, okay, I if, if your rook were on d2, then this king f6 is not possible. But here king f6 is a fantastic move. Mm. You can't, king f8 doesn't work. And when you play this move king uh, d8, then I throw in a check. You go back mm. and I go back. Your position has not improved, right? Always repeat in endgame. Show, the, the now. show where the money is, right? I mean, it doesn't. So that is why we are learning this technique. Mm. Why bridge building is, is not like I was so, I thought that bridge building is the panacea to all the problems, but it is not. Here you cannot build a bridge. This is the point which I want to uh, emphasize. You cannot bridge the build the bridge. So what will you do? Rook behind the pass pawn is also not working. So rook D, rook, rook D1. Rook D1. It is so simple. So this position is trivial, okay? Yeah. You just play rook D1. Yeah. But why I wanted, how I came to this is that I was thinking that, okay, bridge building is the panacea to all the problems. But it is not. Right? Now see, black is lost. He can't do anything. You do whatever you want to do. Rook A2 and then I just... Uh, I can come, I can just bring the king here. You throw in a check, rook a7. I play king d6. 
rook a6, rook d6, yeah. rook down here, and then rook d8. And then when you give a check, my king starts marching closer and closer to the rook and I win. Right? But why I wanted to bring this is that in a trivial position, okay, like I'll tell you the position in the book called uh, 100 End Games, you must know is they have given this position with black to play. And suppose black just waits. Okay, suppose this is black to play, then black's best defense is to play rook d2, but black is a little bit tricky and he thinks that, okay, you might try to build the bridge and he plays rook h3. Wow. Then you cannot, you cannot build the bridge. You have to play rook d1. This is the key point. This is what not everyone tells that, okay, oh, what, I mean, why you need a bridge? Because in some positions, you do not need the bridge itself. Okay, there is an implicit threat in the position. Like suppose I just play rook b1 and he plays rook h1. Then my threat is I will, suppose it was black to play, I just made these moves. And it is black to play, black had played rook h3. Okay, from rook h2, he had played rook h3. Now here, you don't need to build a bridge, just play rook d1 and then you will win. Mm. Right? So this is important. This is what I wanted to tell. One more thing, why you need the different techniques. I want to talk about one more thing. When you have the knight pawn, then transferring the, this uh, controlling the, controlling the file adjacent to the pawn will not work. Who can explain me why it doesn't work in this case? Suppose this is the position. Why will the third technique controlling the file adjacent to the pawn, but on the opposite side of the king not work? Well, we're at the edge of the ball. We can't go over there, can yeah, we? Yeah, if correct. You have nothing to the left of A. Yeah. Imagine yeah. if you had A prime, then I would throw in a check. The king will go to E7, and then yeah. I'll play yeah. rook A prime one, and then I'll play rook A prime eight, and then I'll play rook a8, yeah. push it out and then win. But here there is nothing on the left of A. That is why I'm not able to push you out of this. And here is when I need bridge building. Wow. I cannot win by any other technique other than bridge building. Okay, why I'm talking to so much deeply in this Lucina? Because it looks Lucina, okay, bridge building, nothing to do. But there are so many things, okay, night pawn, you have only bridge building, okay? And when the king and the rook are on the same side, like we saw the last case, you do not need, need bridge building. Use technique three, control the file adjacent to the pawn on the opposite side of the king, win that way. So this is one thing, knight pawn, you cannot uh, win using the bridge building. Otherwise, in all the cases, when the king and the rook are like this, bridge building will work. King and rook are up on the opposite side. This thing you have to understand, the king and rook, why are they stationed like this? Basically, it imprisons the king. I gave you that position where it was not imprisoned. Then you do not need bridge building. Use bridge building only when your king is totally trapped or caged. Then you need bridge building or, if possible, controlling the file adjacent to the pawn uh, on the opposite side of the king. But here it is not possible. That is why... Mm -hmm. Technique three doesn't work. Now I'll give you one interesting problem. Uh, this is from a book. You might, you guys might have heard of it. This is a book called Eleven Fish and Smyslov Rook Endings. So uh, there's a classic book. Now think about this position and tell me, it is white to play. What would happen here? Do, what do you think? Will he win or not? Okay, one thing, before going to this, I want to ask you another, I want to tell you rather one important position uh, here, which is, uh, if I don't tell this, it is, uh, it will be, now, think, if it is black to play, what would be the result of this? Has anyone heard about this? Suppose the same position we started with, right? It is black to play. White to play, you know. You throw in a check, he goes to h7, you have bridge building or the other techniques. What about this position? You have, the, you have the ball the other way around now, do you? Yeah, it is black to play. That's why I flipped the board. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I understand. Isn't it drawn if you just keep throwing checks, a8? Yeah, 
Correct, James, you are right. Absolutely right. I think you have studied the rook endings recently, right? Or you, you already know it well? Uh, I've, I haven't from black side, so I just... It just looks like, yeah, you can't cross over to the F file and then there's nothing to hide behind. So you can just keep checking. It looks yeah, like yeah. That. so that is uh, right. There is a technical term, which is called checking distance. If you see that there is, uh, I mean, take the rook file and take the king file, okay? And you subtract that there are three files in between, right? So the checking distance, this is called, like they have uh, introduced a word just to, uh, basically help us uh, remember that. So this is called checking distance. So the checking distance is three files. If it is more than three files, three or more than three, it is a draw. I will show you. Again, you do not have shelter. Shelter is the most important thing in the rook endings. Okay. Even in the Philidor's defense, the idea is uh, shelter there. You have no shelter. That is why it's a draw. He goes here, check. Goes here, check. Now, if you go here, I go behind the pawn and your pawn is lost. What, what if you go to D5? Okay, you go to D5. Okay, I will, I will not play this now. I'll give us check still, reign of checks. When you are separated from the pawn quite, uh, quite a lot, if you play King C6, right? Then also I'll not, I will give a check from A6. Yeah. So what right? if you go to D4? Okay, you go to D4. Okay, I'll still give check. When you are on the D file, I have to give you checks because I can't go behind. I can't go behind the pawn, right? You are controlling that square. That is your trick. Only if you go to the C file here. Also, if you play king here, uh, yeah. then also I will not go behind the pawn. Okay, I can still throw in a check. When you go to the B file, then I go. When you are separated from the pawn, then I go behind the pawn and win the pawn. So what happens if you go e5 instead from d4? Okay. From d4, you want to go to e5. Yeah. Okay. Check. F, F4. Okay. You are trying to use your rook uh, slowly, right? Uh, I understand your technique here that you want to uh, use your rook as a... But I'll show you why it will not work. Because my king is not far off, okay? I oh, can catch yeah, the yeah, pawn. Yeah. yeah, you're just going to swap the rooks and then get the pawn. Yeah. If I swap yeah. the rooks, I my king is able to catch yeah. the pawn. That is why in the Lucina first step is push the king so that it is separated by two yeah. files. Yeah. If you do not push that, then hmm. you will not be able to win, okay? You have to push here. You can't, okay? You, you try to do that. I'll trade rooks and catch the pawn. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing uh, which is important that you cannot here also i will tell you one thing which is important uh okay suppose black is playing poorly okay i'll make a weak move from black because correct move is to throw in a check just continue the idea of perpetual check and when the king is separated quite uh, far from the pawn then go behind the pawn okay even trading the rooks will not help Suppose he plays a horrendous move, rook a8. <laughs> this is a horrendous move, but how would you win in this position? Now you can do a check. No, no, you don't. No, no, no. King f7. Yeah. Yeah, that's no good. Can you get your rook in the way? How? Uh, rook c1. Okay, first move you want to play rook c1. Yeah, the idea is to just block uh, more checks and then okay, try rook and coordinate C1. to push the pawn. Okay, rook c1 if I play king f7, then what is your idea? Mm. Um, then mm. can't you play king d7 and then No, it doesn't work. King d7, okay. There is some idea there. Uh, rook. But I will give you a check then. Rook a7. And then, you can, and then you can block with your rook again. Then no, you I'll exchange the rook. Up the phone. Yeah, exchange ah. the rook and pick the pawn, right? Mm, interesting. Yeah. So think about some other idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. you said rook a8 was a funny move, but it looks like a good move. Yeah, so you have to, I mean, it's a funny move, it's a horrendous move, but you have to have a 
refutation of it. If you yeah. don't find the refutation, then it's a good move, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So, okay. Yeah, think. Let you think first. Brew, brew it. So, 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 King D seven. King D seven. Uh, then I start the reign of perpetual check. Suppose I miss the idea, but now I'm back to oh, the. Track. Okay. Yeah, we don't want that. We got to do something different. Yeah, you are walking on a tight rope. Okay, you have to strike at this moment itself otherwise suppose he gets the idea okay yeah. it was a horrendous move now i get the idea yeah okay i'll tell the move it's a shocking move something which will make which will make you fall off the chair can you think of a move which is uh, which uh, will, which will make you fall off the chair uh, king c5 would make me fall off the chair <laughs> king c5 okay uh, i was not i was i was thinking of <laughs> Sacking the rook and then trying to pick up the rook with I've just real, but I don't know if it works. What is the move? Tell me. You, I think you are <laughs> close to the idea. I was thinking rook a one, then rook yes. takes rook, but then I can't see. Somehow you have to promote and try and fork, but I can't see. Oh no, you can't. I mean, see, I'll, you are you are on the correct idea. You have found the tactical refutation. Mm -hmm. The point is, in some of this rook pawn, rook plus pawn versus rook ending, you have to get into this. Queen versus rook ending. Why you want rook a1? This is the idea. You want to take away. See, if he exchanges the rook, you are in a theoretically winning queen versus rook ending. Oh, okay. Right? But if you say that, okay, I will play king here, king e8, then I attack your rook. Wow. You play this, I attack. I mean, what I do? You will run out of the square. Okay, hold on, hold on. Here, uh, what happened? You went here. You went here, right? Mm -hmm. I attack your rook. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do? You are lost, right? Beat rook b8. Rook b8, right. and then push the pawn and promote. Yeah, it's right? lost. It's lost. Yeah. So it is. It is lost. So that is why you, uh, you black is actually has to find the correct move. If he plays rook a a8, you can transition into a winning queen versus rook ending. This is the key point which I'm trying to tell. Okay, rook a1 is actually a so, great idea. I think who found James found it, right? Yeah. Yeah, he found that rook a1 is a brilliant idea. And basically, because there are uh, three files that rook is caught, right? He you cannot escape. Now so there's, this, no, there's no better, there's no better win. That that is the winning move, rook a1. Yeah. Otherwise, the point is black, suppose he realizes his mistake and starts giving these horizontal okay. checks. Then you have no umbrella, right? Your rook is not able to mm. provide the shelter. It cannot block the check, right? So if you cannot block the check, you will not be able to win. That is why you you are uh, you have to play this rook a1. Okay, I mean this is the winning. It is not that you have to queen versus rook. You are winning immediately, but you are winning theoretically. There is no how, doubt in that. How how easy is it to win queen versus rook? Because you've got queen. to do it. You've got to do it in a timely fashion, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 50 move rule is there. That is there. It is difficult, but okay, there is a Philidor position in that which involves triangulation and Zugzwang. It is difficult, <laughs> but uh, I mean, this is the best you can get in this from this position. Right, right. I right. mean, definitely it is difficult. One has to learn it properly. It is something I find it slightly more difficult than the Bishop Knight checkmate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The key, the, the key to this is to try to not get to this position as white, but to try to get to a slightly better position than this as white. Yeah, yeah. But suppose uh, at times you do not have, you yeah. cannot get the yeah. best of both the worlds, right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not that uh, everything will be handed to you in a platter yeah, sure, by opponent, sure, right? Sure. <laughs> but you're you're aiming at end games that you know how to win. Yeah, yeah. So and one I, has to one has to learn the queen versus rook because rook plus pawn versus rook will transition into a queen versus rook and yeah, several yeah. of the games. Yeah. Now uh, I want to give you two problems before we call it a day. I mean, from my yeah, end. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. This problem, and I want you to think, and it is black to play, and what do you think will be the result of this position? Mm. He's 
too close for checking distance from what you said earlier. I think it was free. Files, yeah, right? correct. So this is win for white, right? Um, you're right. You're, yeah, Vim, so. you're absolutely right. The checking distance is two files and I want to prove it here. It transitions into that queen versus rook ending. Okay. It throws in a check. This is why you need to know this uh, queen versus rook ending. Maybe someday I probably cover it, but it is quite, uh, mm. quite lengthy. Okay. King d8. He goes here. Uh, you attack the rook. Mm -hmm. You will attack the rook or... Yeah, I'm just thinking. Uh, why not? Yeah, why not attack the rook, right? Yeah. And he has to play rook here, and yeah. now you will play rook a1 because if you don't do rook a1, the checks will start. Can you play rook b1? Rook b1. Oh no, the king moves over. Yeah, yeah, rook, because the moment the cutoff yeah, is lost, yeah, right? I yeah. mean, uh, the problem is that the king yeah. comes closer. Yeah, you can't have the king coming over now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that is why in this position also, you have to see why I showed you that one. It's not enough to just know the checking distance. You have to find the move, the surprising move, rook a1. Yeah. yeah. And now black is lost because he will take the rook win and lose that way, queen versus rook. And if he plays this, you have one a tempo now. He goes here, he goes here, and then you. Run. Mm. Mm. Okay, this is a very interesting thing to know how to win also. Even though this is correct that uh, the checking distance is two files, so it is not enough. But how to win is also you have to know that, okay, you have to find the move to K1, right? Now I want to ask you another position. This is from okay. Levenfish and Smyslov, Rook Endings. This is a position which is uh, good to know, slightly tricky. Now this one, what do you think? The same thing I've shifted by one file. Now think about this. So who's to move? Black to move. I flipped the board, it is yeah. black to move. Yeah, okay, yeah. The last position was everything shifted by uh, one file to the right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I shifted that by one file. So, this should be easy based on what you've previously told us. But there is a subtle, see, chess, uh, this rook endings is very complex because they are very subtle. There are a lot of subtleties and finishes, okay? That makes it a little bit tricky. The positions look, all, all the positions look similar, but they aren't, right? Yeah. Is, is it that the difference is because there's an extra file? Yeah. So what he doesn't it... have to force the rook trade in the, by playing, so in the previous position, um, you could force the rook trade, yeah. or he had to sit in front of the pawn. Yeah, that, um, but that... this time he has an extra square to to work with, an extra file. So, whom would it benefit? <laughs> I think that benefits black. No, because I think it's probably still winning for white, but I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't no, think I... I would know how. <laughs> uh, you are uh, see you are uh, 50 50 actually you what you said is that it helps the defender and it it is actually a draw okay i will show you now the reason so it is not just that initial checking distance i'll show you the reason this is very very subtle this is advanced because this guy levenfish was a authority in rook endings right smisla and levenfish it's very quite advanced you play this right mm -hmm. it comes out uh, at this moment so, I mean, he comes out, He what will he do? He will give you another you, check. You have to. Yeah, so you have to come here. And I come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what will you do? You'll attack this rook. Yeah. I play rook a1. Yeah. Now, in the previous case, you were able to attack this rook and uh, force and win a tempo. But when you play rook a1, I would not trade this, but I will play rook b8. Oh. This extra file will help me to salvage a draw. Oh. This is very tricky, okay? I mean, everything mm -hmm. is same, but the extra file, as James Intuition was telling is correct, that the extra file helps you to, uh, to hold, to salvage a draw, actually. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have an extra file, then white was winning like in the previous case. That is the 
subtle difference between the two diagrams the extra yeah. file yeah. helps mm -hmm. the defender because he you cannot force the trade now he what in book seven fish what they mentioned you play this again he will play rook eight mm. not mm. trade the rooks okay if he trades the rooks he is lost hopelessly lost but he will just play rook eight gosh so is this starting position a theoretical draw or is it losing with that same technique or is there a oh, technique to win it this te point? this time with black to play this is a theoretical draw okay i mean uh, and this is easy to understand also see what is the difference right now from the other position in this position when we had there was no i mean you th you threw in a check right but he went here you threw in another check and when he went here if he i mean uh, he goes back right or we, we had looked at this mm -hmm. uh, when you attack this rook he went here right and you were able to play rook a1 but imagine so, that there is an another yeah, file here yeah, yeah. so he will okay. not exchange he will just go there mm. and it <laughs> will be a draw that is what is happening in the other uh, example that the extra file helps the defender so this is a theoretical draw uh, in that this one these last two positions are little bit advanced in the sense that i mean uh, it is a nuanced concept which is there in very uh, few books which they i mean i have only seen in leven fish and smithlock but this one you have to know that uh, i told you right black uh, in the initial position was holding a draw not in this one but uh, the position which we had discussed yeah. that yeah. Uh, the checking distance was enough and he was holding a draw but mm -hmm. black can make a horrendous move and then white wins with that trick of converting it into a rook queen versus rook ending okay so before i uh, conclude i just want to tell that these three techniques you have to know and also lot of times it transitions into a queen versus rook ending that is the only way to uh, theoretically or mathematically win that position so one has to know the queen versus rook ending that is a prerequisite okay it's not that you can avoid that because in some positions you have to get that position mm. i mean there's nothing better than that i th i think it's interesting because most people would um settle for a queen versus rook ending and not knowing exactly how to win would think yeah. it would be easy and would start checking all over the place and if the rook uh if if the opponent with the rook knew what he was doing then i guess it's quite tough to win yeah yeah in fact uh, this you can see there is a game between boris gelfand and peter swidler where peter swidler had a queen and he was not able to win against boris gelfand mm. uh, it is queen versus rook surprisingly is not a easy uh, easy win for the queen but it is theoretically winning it takes a lot of effort but it is winning but most most players who who didn't know that um didn't know how difficult it was would just go rushing into it thinking yeah. that yeah. they could win and and then they wouldn't be able to uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If it was not possible for Peter Swidler, a uh, elite grandmaster, <laughs> exactly. then yeah. we mortal humans can, uh, I mean, yeah. just uh, yeah. think about the complexity of it, right? We 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 must look at that um, on our next call. I think queen queen uh, versus rook. I think cool. that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. We'll look at it. Hey, look, this has been really good. No, it's been I. I I've seen these things before, and the more you see them, the more you learn. Hopefully, the more you remember. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think the key thing is, you know, if you're if you're black, uh, don't give up. Try and try and find the right move because white probably doesn't necessarily know how to win, and you can draw. Yeah, yeah. And also, one one more thing is there, like. uh this i learned from this uh, jesus de la villa this book is fantastic 100 and games you must know uh, and what he the author emphasizes and i feel that is quite true you have to understand the idea especially in this rook pawn versus rook ending you cannot just move uh, memorize the variation you have to think about the key concept okay shelter okay i need a yeah. shelter for the king and you have to verbalize it rather than remembering the variation it is unlike the opening where you can memorize and get away with it but here it is a understanding of the concept then only you can find the variation otherwise you can't find it
Yeah, very well said. Very well said. Okay. Anyone got any um, final comments or thoughts on all of that? No, just just say thank you. That was very instructive. And uh, thank you. I mean, right now I feel very confident about winning that end game, but in another month, <laughs> what worries me is how I've forgotten again. <laughs> but yeah, I think even on Wikipedia, this is well explained. You can go through that and okay. go through no, it multiple times. Uh, I think uh, this is another thing. One has to go through it multiple times, yes. practice it, and then yeah. only you can uh, get the hang of it. 